must go through life pretending. Pretending that we're satisfied where we are, pretending that everything is okay, pretending that, that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires, when really deep down inside we do really want more. Find out what it is you want and go after it as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. It's time for you to look within yourself and decide that I'm in charge of my destiny. I'm in charge here. Les Brown believes that you have the power to change your life. And he knows what he's talking about because he's done it. Les and his twin brother grew up on the tough streets of Miami's Liberty City after being adopted at the age of six weeks by Mamie Brown, a single woman with a big heart. Les still calls himself Mamie's boy. She expected things of him, so he graduated from high school, although he'd been mistakenly labeled mentally retarded in grammar school, and he built himself a successful career as a fast-talking disc jockey, although he had no radio training. And he became a community leader and was eventually elected to three full terms in the Ohio State Legislature. Along the way, Les developed a hunger for reading and self-improvement that led to his speaking career. Today, he spends his time enjoying his family, relaxing and being with his six children, and giving about 200 speeches a year, which focus on helping people find ways to overcome the obstacles they face in their own lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. How many of you thought about some things that you know that you deserve or you want out of life or you would like to enjoy experience and you found yourself blocking yourself? Raise your hand if that ever happened to you before. All right, very good. Here's what I want you to do. Shake somebody's hand on your right and your left and here's what I want you to say. Whatever you're seeking, Whatever you're seeking it's seeking you. It's seeking you. You can have it. You can have it. Give yourselves a round of applause, all right? <laughs> Now, the reason I brought that up is I was riding with a friend the other day, and I, I know this friend of mine who has been working on a job where she's been miserable for a long time. She was telling me about how she was miserable on the job and how, how she was so unhappy. So I said, if, this, if it's that stressful and, and if it's causing you that much pain, I say, why don't you just quit and do something else? And she said something that really put her in the chorus line with a lot of other people. She said, I would, but. <laughs> and then I started to thinking about that. I said, let me take a poll. So I started talking to other people and I would ask them what they were doing. And I said, but is that your passion? And they would say, no. I said, then what's your real passion? And they would tell me what their real passion was. Then I said, well, then why aren't you doing what you really want to do? Oh, I can do it, but. And they would continue on. So this word, you know, but just kept on coming up. And then it also has some friends like woulda and coulda and shoulda. <laughs> and one day I'm going to have my own business. Those people who talk about one day I'm going to. Some of y'all know some of those one day I'm going to people. Are. Raise your hand. Some of you get up in the morning and look in the mirror at that person. <laughs> I just tease it. I just tease it. All right. So how is it that many times we block ourselves and we use these words almost like we're in a trance, like we're sleepwalking through life, that we find ways to cancel out our dreams. And I think that but is a dream killer, that a lot of things that we want to do, a lot of places we would like to go, a lot of things we would like to experience, and we just stop at but, and we build a case. In fact, I was reading something the other day that, that talked about, but it says, but is an argument for our limitations. And when we argue for our limitations, we get to keep them. <laughs> See, but will cause you to procrastinate. But will cause you to hide out behind fear. But will cause you to come up with all type of excuses that you can validate your inaction and not acting on your dream. And right now, more than ever, people need to look for ways to live their dream. People need, need to look for ways to make it on their own. There is no such thing as job security. There's no such thing as a storm-proof or tragic-proof life. 
There are no guarantees today, ladies and gentlemen. The illusion is gone. There was a time when, when we graduated from high school, you were told, go to college and get out, and you go and work for a corporation for 30 or 40 years, they'll give you a go watch and you'll retire. A special announcement, that day is gone. <laughs> that day is gone, never to return again. So instead of people living in fear, feeling stressed out, feeling powerless, feeling like victims, I think it should be a time that we need to begin to look at ways that we can become an active force in our own lives. Look at ways when we can decide to take charge of our own destiny. Look at ways when we can decide to design a life of substance and begin to truly live our dreams. And it's time for people to decide, I'm ready to get on with my life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left. A guy named Bob May say this, say, don't let nobody turn you around. Do that right quick. <laughs> Now, you know, a lot of people say, I'm going to live my life one day when things get right. When I get all my bills paid. When I get my feet on the ground. I say, what have you been walking on? <laughs> See, there are no problem-free moments. A guy named Dimples had a record one time called, if it ain't one thing, it's another. And I say, if it ain't one thing, it's 12 others always something there to build a case on why you can't move on why you can't grow to the next level why you can't begin to manifest your greatness why you can't begin to live life on your terms always something there to block you to keep you where you are and keep you from beginning to develop your true greatness always some fear how do we handle it and I'm saying that if you've been hiding out behind but if you've been using the fact that you don't have enough money or you don't have the education, take it head on. Go get the education. I was saying to a guy the other day who was saying, he, he, I said, how old are you? He says, 47 years old. I said, your sister tell me that you can't read. He said, that's right. I said, why? Well, you know, I, I, I didn't go to school. I said, Excuse me, how old are you? I'm 47. 47? Yes. And you can't read or write? Yes. Have you ever heard of adult school, adult education? Have, have you decided that you should learn how to read to begin to expand your world? Why are you using that as a racket? Why don't you decide now that you're going to expand your world? That if other people can learn, you could learn too. Well, it's hard for me. How do you, have you been and sit in a class yet? Have you signed up yet? No, I haven't. See, a lot of people say no, ladies and gentlemen, to things, and they don't even know what they're saying no to. They haven't even challenged themselves. He hasn't even gone to sit into a class and say, teach me how to read. Instead, it's been easier for him to go through life, he thinks, trying to play a whole con game, pretending he knows how to do something that he doesn't know how to do. And you know what? Most of us go through life like that. Most of us go through life pretending pretending that we're satisfied where we are, pretending that everything is okay, pretending that, that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires, when really deep down inside we do really want more. But if you look at our behavior, if you judge based upon what we do, that really will tell you some true stories about people because you have to judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not the fruit that it talks about. See, a lot of people pretend that they want more out of life, but all you have to do is watch their actions. That will tell you something. So I used to pretend that I wanted to lose weight, but how could you tell I was pretending? Watch me when I have a piece of sweet potato pie. <laughs> Let me get within walking distance of some peanuts. <laughs> some potato chips. See, I was pretending that I really want to lose weight. No, you just watch what I eat. I'll tell you what I'm seriously committed to. People tell you, oh yeah, one day I want to have a restaurant. See, they're pretending they want to go into business for themselves. They're not serious. How can you tell less? Watch their actions. Watch what they're doing. The proof is in the pudding. So if you want to do something, if you thought about something you want to do, take it head on. Decide that you're going to start looking at it, start doing research on it, start tackling it, 
start becoming involved in whatever and wherever it might lead you to begin to explore the possibilities in that particular thing that you're seeking so that you can begin to learn all you can about it. Decide that you're going to face it, that whatever shortcomings you have, that you're going to strengthen yourself there. Whatever training that's required, that you're going to go get that training, that you're going to get started right now. The George Washington Carver would say, do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. S.B. Fuller used to say, and you heard Joe Dudley talk about, always strive to be more than that which you are. Yeah, don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. But most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely, tiptoeing to an early grave. Find out what it is you want and go after it as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. People that have found their passion, people that found the things that they love, people that have found the things that they can pour their lives into, those people live longer. I was in New York and I had to do a seminar at a special church and a guy by the name of Reverend Johnny Youngblood. And I said, how is it that you were able to build this big housing facility and got all of the various community and religious groups together to, to have this dwelling for 2,000 residents that were, were once homeless? How were you able to take on this responsibility? Wasn't it overwhelming? He said, the kind of work I do, he said, it's in me. I've got to live what's in me. And I think that's everybody's desire in life. You've got to live what's in you. Life is just too short and unpredictable. But what, are, what do we say? But, but there will always be tomorrow. Oh, no. There are no guarantees you're going to show up tomorrow. There are a lot of people who were here yesterday that they're not here today. There are up, a lot of opportunities that were around yesterday. They're not here today. Oh, you can wait, but you know what Abraham Lincoln said? Well, good things might come to those who, to, who wait, but only the things that have been left over by those who hustle. <laughs> <laughs> so who want to go through life picking up leftovers? You deserve much more than that. The leftovers that somebody has left you. So take it head on, begin to explore it. Here's something else. Decide to do it now. Decide whatever you want to do, that you are now going to become actively involved right now, exploring the possibilities for you. That you're going to look at it and do just a little bit of it right now. When I decided to become a speaker, I didn't just quit my job and just ran out and say, I'm a motivational speaker. No. What I did was I decided to start looking at other people that were involved in the speaking profession. I volunteered to work with some speakers so that I could learn. Whatever you want to do, get your feet wet. Gain some experience doing some volunteer work in the area and find out whether or not this thing you want to do will fit for you. A friend of mine told me he wanted to have a restaurant. I said, have you ever operated a restaurant before? He said, no. I said, well, really, you don't even know if you want one. I said, what's your expertise? What do you bring to the table? He said, I can cook real good. I said, well, what about the management side? What about the business part of the restaurant? You're not going to be cooking all the time. Somebody's got to receive the money. Who's going to manage the personnel? He said, you got a right. You got a point there. So this guy got a job in a restaurant in the evening time on a part-time basis. After doing that for a while, he said, you know what? I think I just want to be a chef. <laughs> he said, after working there, people didn't show up to work. He, he said, it's hard to find the help. People weren't responsible, the headaches, the guests were just giving him problems day in and day out. They weren't ever satisfied. He said, no, I just think I'll stick to cooking. <laughs> See, you got to find out what fits for you. Because you might decide that after you go up in there and examine it and experience it and, and get some experience under your belt on it, well, you say, this is really not what I want. This does not fit for me. So decide that you're going to do that. Now, John H. Johnson said something that's very important. He said, there is no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. See, whatever you decide to do, look at it and find out what is it that I have that I could bring to the table that can begin to enable me to ensure that I could be successful in this. Where is the opening for you? There's room for you out here. Out here in the arena called life, there's room for you to come out and live your dream. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner, or keep you up in the bleachers, looking at life, being a spectator, not being a participant, making a difference in life. I believe that all of us came here with something. All of us showed up to give something, and that nobody 
but nobody's going to give that service that you have to give. No one's going to produce your product. No one's going to write your book. No one's going to open your academy. No one's going to begin to create your daycare with a special curriculum to help to cultivate the high self-esteem in our children. That's your idea. And if you don't bring your idea out here, when you die, all of us will suffer because we've been deprived of your genius because you allowed butt to keep you in the bleachers and not pursuing your greatness. You take it to your grave with you. And that's what most people do. I think that's why the guy said that many people die at age 21 and don't get buried until they're 65. They're walking dead. You can tell them by the way they walk. <laughs> How they look in the face when they speak to you. I was giving a speech at this high school and a lady came after school. She said, Mr. Brown, I want to talk to you about my son. I said, what is it? She said, he's not motivated. <laughs> I said, I wonder why. to have energy ladies and gentlemen you got to have life if you excited about what you're doing even in the area of selling you know people don't buy because of logical reasoning people buy because of your way of feeling people don't like to be around dead people no no let the dead bury the dead no no keep them away from me before they grab you or a hold on to you <laughs> so the fact that that whatever you do you want to be excited about it you want to have the kind of excitement that is so contagious that people want to be around you. Because whatever you're doing, whatever you talk to people about this particular idea that you have, they're looking at you and they want to know, do you believe it? And are you the kind of person they want to be in business with? And if you're not positive, if you're not energetic, if you're not fired up about it, how can you expect anybody else to be fired up about your idea? Am I right? All right, re repeat after me, please. I'm going to be fired up about my dream. I'm going to go at it with everything I got. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got what it takes. <laughs> there are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice and it didn't work out. And so they use that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Guy said, um, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if you have come out here with an idea and it didn't work out two or three times, well, that's all right. You're running about average. You know, I heard something, a, a, a jarring question. It says, why is it that people prefer known hells to unknown heavens. You know why? Because it's comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. I remember I was in um, a service once and I heard Dr. Johnny Coleman give this example. She talked about a man who had been captured behind the enemy lines in a war and was sentenced to, to be killed or another option captain said to the guy listen he said tomorrow morning at six o'clock you can face the firing squad or you can go out this door over here and the guy said what's out the door he said no one knows all we can tell you just unknown horrors he thought and the next morning he selected the firing squad after the shots rang out the captain's secretary said what's beyond that door and he said freedom but very few people would select to do it because it's unknown a lot of people never do the things they want to do a lot of people stay on jobs where they're miserable I read an article called is your job making you sick a lot of people some of y'all know about that already here <laughs> So go on and say amen. It's all right. <laughs> that one lady told me, she said, Les, I, when I used to go to work, she said, when I stepped in the door, it felt like a refrigerator dropped on my shoulders. How many of y'all understand that kind of feeling? <laughs> they were miserable, just hated to go after 60 minutes on Sunday afternoon 
Oh, come Monday morning, my head used to throb. I just couldn't take it. Didn't want to go sometimes just, just for the heck of it. I just drive on by. <laughs> I, I used to hate to go to work. Many of us choose an active living death. Many of us are walking dead. The walking dead. That we're not doing what we want to do. Many of us stay in relationships where we're dying together rather than growing and expanding and living together. We're miserable, but because we don't have the courage to see ourselves beyond that relationship that has turned toxic. We go through life living dead people. And you can always tell couples that have been together for a little while. <laughs> go in a restaurant, the ones sitting side by side, giggling and talking to each other, feeding each other with their fork and spoon. They just got together for one week. You see them in the car, they're sitting all up each other, hugging and smoking. Oh, they've been together about three days, all right? <laughs> but if you see people sitting in a restaurant, two people, you know, see a couple, and they're sitting in front of each other. <laughs> Takes so long for this food, I wonder when they're going to hurry up. Those are the married ones. <laughs> I mean, what if I know people have been married for years, living in two separate rooms? Sleeping in two separate beds, well, it's cheaper to keep it. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's according to the price you want to pay. See, the price of peace of mind, the price of living the truth, of being honest with yourself and say, wait a minute, it's got to be more than this. So you've got to decide, wait, wait. Even if I, I, things don't work out, even if I experience defeat or failure, that does not make me a failure. It's a difference between failing and being a failure. If, you, if things don't work out, if you don't produce the results you want, that's all. But don't confuse who you are with the results that you produce. I used to be a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. And I remember once I was going to introduce some legislation on the floor, and after getting that legislation passed, um, a guy came up behind me, and he had some legislation that I opposed him on that. And I was about to stand up to debate this guy, and the guy next to me said, excuse me, don't, don't debate that guy. Why? Do you know who that is? I said, no. That's Will Kowski from Toledo. It's a bad dude. He's a lawyer, Les. That man can debate. I don't care. I'm Les Brown. Maybe Brown's both. <laughs> I raised my hand, Mr. Speaker. He said, the gentleman from the 29th House District? He said, yes, sir. To tell the gentleman I'd like to take him on. Challenge him on this legislation. He said, Wilkos, he said, I would more than like to, Mr. Speaker. Everybody would say, whoa. I asked him some questions. He responded. I said, I wonder why I asked that man that question. <laughs> Wilkoski wore me out. I mean, I was so embarrassed, I just limped back to my room with my yes, I can attitude. <laughs> However, here's what I learned. When you win, see, if I win a debate, I win because of what I know. When I lose, I lose because what I don't know. So I had to check out what is it that I did not know. I wasn't prepared. I did not do enough research. I did not do my homework. So he handled me like he wanted to. So I came back again. I waited on some other legislation, did my whole work, but he was more than able to take me out again. But pretty soon, each time it would take him, it would become a little bit more difficult and a little bit more difficult. And the older guy said, would you argue in behalf of this legislation for me? I said, sure. I started volunteering to do work in the legislative committees for the older guys. I said, absolutely. And the more I did it, the better I became. And then people began to start respecting me. And when I would ask and say, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to speak on that bill. Some guys' lips start trembling and stuff, like Jimmy. I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Is there anything wrong? Do we have a problem here? <laughs> but if I wasn't willing to be humiliated, if I wasn't willing to allow myself to be embarrassed, if I wasn't willing to be de debated and defeated, if I wasn't willing to look at it and say, well, I, I, I'm just not good as I'm going to be. You know what that lady say? Lord, I ain't what I want to be, ain't what I'm going to be, but thank God I show ain't what I was. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense?
See, you want to learn all you can in life. You've got to be willing to experiment. You've got to be willing to learn to dance with life. You know, Larry DeAngelo said, if you don't learn to dance with life, life will pass you by and get another partner. <laughs> I'm saying you're going to have to dance even if you don't want to. You're going to have to dance with life. So you might as well learn you some steps because it's going to drag you out on the floor anyhow. So you better get out there and try to do the twists. <laughs> try to do something. Say, life, is it looking all right? <laughs> because life going to put some knots on your head anyhow. I mean, you, you know, he'll come up in the bleachers and slap you before everybody. It's, that's it. Why? It's called life. No one is immune. Just think, just over a year ago, everybody's talking about Donald Trump. He was a darling of America, the American dream fulfilled. Just over a year ago, less than two years, everything that people were bragging about, this wealthy, invincible American figure, look what has happened now. Everybody, no one, no one is exempt from that. I was talking to a friend of mine by the name of Maria. And Maria, who was diagnosed as having muscular dystrophy at age 15 and wheelchair bound, figured that enough had happened to her. She was somewhat immune, she felt, unconsciously, from any more accidents or misfortunes in life. Her wheelchair malfunctioned. She fell out, suffered a closed head injury, almost went blind, lost her memory and concentration for a long period of time. She said, on that day, Les, I decided to live. I said, why? She said, life is about today. She said, I, I felt because what had happened to me, I was exempt somehow. No, no. Life will knock on everybody's door. I don't care how, who you are, care how nice you are. Life will come get you. Life, people will dislike you because you're nice. Oh, she thinks she's nice. She's some Miss, Miss Goody Two-Shoe. People will dislike you because you look better than they do. Because you have more than they, they do. They'll be envious and make up lies about you and attack you. The envious of you. Why? I don't know. That's the way they set it up. I don't know. I don't even ask any questions. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is. Handle it. And that's what Maria said, Les, I'm going to live. She said, they told me I was going to go blind. I said, wait a minute, can you imagine me around a shopping center in a wheelchair and a walking dog too? Oh, no. <laughs> she said, I'm going to see, Doc. I've got to. And she can see today. That, that willpower, that determinate, very positive, upbeat person. I say, but don't, don't, sometimes you feel sorry for yourself and don't you wish you had the capacity to do what other people do? She said, I don't waste my time comparing my condition with other people, one. And she said, people that suffer from a lack of motivation suffer mainly from a lack of self-appreciation. She said, I know that I have value and the fact that I'm in a wheelchair doesn't make me any less of a human being who can contribute something to life. And I'm saying that there are, all of us can begin to affirm that, that my life is worthwhile. Doesn't matter what I've experienced, doesn't matter about what I don't have, doesn't matter about what I've gone through. What's important is that where I am right now, that I live life and I experience my life fully. She said, Les, before the accident, I wasn't living 100% of my life. I said, what were you living? She said, around 20%. And I said, you know what? I said, I know what that's like. See, if you go through life holding back, and most of us do, most of us, if we ask ourselves, have we done all we can do? Most of us will have to answer, no, we haven't. We've been holding back. We have ideas that we don't act on, things we want to do. We're afraid to take chances. We go through life trying to seek security and not coming outside of our comfort zone. And we take most of our stuff with us to the grave. And I'm saying that the fact that you're still here, that you're still breathing, you've got some more work, and you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself. So when you get up in the morning, that you can look yourself in the face and say, hey, I'm living my life on my terms. That's important. Not to give up on your dream, not to give up on yourself. Now, are there going to be some moments when you want to give up? Yes. Will there be some moments when it's going to seem like it's impossible, the pain that you're experiencing? the disappointment that you're experiencing, that you're going to say, it's not worth it? Yes, that's, that's going to be 
right there for you. It's, it's going to be in your face telling you to go back. You're going to start listening to the butts, and, and butts will have all kind of help and support from your family members and friends saying, I told you, fool. <laughs> You're going out to this positive thinking stuff. Look at you now. Bet you wish you had that job now. Remember, I lost my job. I was very controversial in, in Columbus, Ohio, in broadcasting. I lost my job, and, and here's what I learned. That you've got to immediately start using your energy positively. The old folks used to say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. That's real. I mean, when I didn't have anything to do, my mind used to say, you better go back and get your job. <laughs> Why did you just shut up? Always run your mouth. Quack, 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 quack. Why did you just hush? You'll be working right now. Broadcasting was all that I knew. And that was my life. I, I love talking to people. And I love playing the records. Used to come on there, look out, this is Les Brown. All right, get up, face these, raise your right hand. Throw your head back. Put your teeth in and say, I am somebody. <laughs> Now, here's what you discover when you're real good at what you do. A lot of people will find you to be a threat. They want to hire you. Oh, they want people in there. They can control or dominate. So if you're a high-powered person, sometimes that can be a liability for you. So it was difficult for me to get a job in broadcasting. Did not get a job in broadcasting. Had to take another route. Had to begin to use my talents and abilities in another area. Wherever you are right now, I'm saying to you, you've got at least three or four or five talents that you are not even aware of right now. And you'll never be aware of them unless you come outside your comfort zone and challenge yourself to develop your talents and abilities. To see what it is that you might have a knack for that you haven't discovered as yet. See, most people never discover their true potential or their other talents and abilities because they figure that they're one-dimensional. And they don't try and stretch themselves and learn more. Guys say, he who learn, learns the most, earns the most. See, if you start learning more things and finding out and experimenting with your life and finding out what else fits for you, here's what you discover, that as you start working with it, and the more you do it, the more you realize other ideas coming to you, the more creative you can become. And then you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Th th you know, this comes much, much more easily than I, I realize. I I've developed a knack and a style for this. See, a guy said to me, he said, if you develop your gifts. See, you, you like to talk, you like people. I said, yeah. He said, if you develop your gifts, he said, your gifts will take you a long ways in life. And ladies and gentlemen, because I decided. So I used to be a jack of all trades and master of none. I tried to, I used to be a disc jockey state representative, community activist, used to do public relations work, used to promote shows, used to be an MC in a nightclub, used to own a nightclub, the Pink Pussycat in Columbus, Ohio. I did everything, sold insurance, you name it, door-to-door -door salesman, I did it all. But finally, I decided to focus my energy. I looked at all my talents and abilities. I said, well, I, I've got to just find what's my one thing. What's my trump card? What's the one thing that I do better than I do anything else? I said, well, I like to do a lot of things. I like to promote. I like the MC. I like to talk. I like being a disc jockey, program director. I like being a community activist. I enjoyed being a state legislator. But I had to find one thing. And I found that one thing. I decided I was going to develop myself as a speaker. And I started following other speakers around. I started doing research. I would read about Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Booger T. Washington, Winston Churchill. The truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. Carlisle, truth crushed the earth, shall rise again. I would follow um, Dr. Otis Moss. I read to Dr. Martin Luther King, said he's the greatest preacher in the world. I used to follow him. Of Charles Adams out of, Columbus, out of Detroit, Michigan. Any great speakers, I would follow them and watch him. I'd be in the back just checking them out. Used to watch Billy Graham on television. Turn the volume down to watch his hand movements because he's so expressive with his hands. I just became a student of the area that I wanted to become involved in. I would go to the motivational rallies, join the National Speaker association and watching all these guys and then I would work in practice in other areas and developing my own style sometimes I would imitate other guys and eventually what you'll begin to do is that you emerge and develop your own style as you do it and work with and work with and work with and work with it and I say to you that is so exciting people that are working on their dreams and developing themselves they have a different kind of walk 
have different kind of energy. You can tell in the tempo of their conversation, they walk differently. They have a lot of energy. They have a glow about them. People that aren't working on their dream. See, there, there, there is a, you can tell in how they, their the movement, their body language, uh, their the, the voice conversation. They're real slow. Hey, I, I'll just call. I wasn't doing nothing. Thought I'd call you. Well, don't do that over here. <laughs> They look at a lot of television. What's on? I don't know. I'm just looking. No, <laughs> no you got to watch this. You, gotta, you, gotta, you don't want to be like that. You, you want to actively be involved in creating life and making it exciting for you. See, if you watch the news all day and read what's happening in the newspaper, you'll be scared to come out your house. Am I right? You'll be scared around here. See, you've got to, to keep the little boy and the little girl alive in you. See, most people don't smile. You know that? Just smile. Just, just smile sometimes. You know, you, you're, even if you're homely, you look good when you smile. Watch this. Isn't that something? Smile at a homely person on your right and left right quick. You know that? <laughs> now, if you look over there and they're already smiling, and you are the homely one. <laughs> I just played. I just played. I'm glad to be alive. And so, I, I feel like that. You know, Robert Elliott, who's the head of the cardiology department at the University of Nebraska, he suffered a massive heart attack. He was in the hospital for three months. And while there, he reflected on his life after this near-death experience. Because his mother and father, both of them had no history of heart failure. Both of them lived to be over 80. And he wrote something. In order to live a long life and be happy, he said, number one, rule number one, don't sweat the small stuff. And rule number two, it's all small stuff. <laughs> Isn't that real? That's real. See, if you're working on your dream, sure there are going to be times you're going to want to give up. Sure there will be times in life I'll knock you down and catch you on the blind side. But the challenge is, is to hold on. And if you hold on tenaciously, I say the universe is on your side. A way will come out of nowhere. Someone will step forward and help you. Just a blessing. Who are you? I don't know, but thank you for coming. Hey. <laughs> So don't allow the difficult and challenging times to demoralize you. I love to quote this guy, Charles Udall. He said, in life you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. And I'm saying, in your hands, you have ideas. You have been given something to bring to the universe that was not here before you showed up. See, nobody, ladies and gentlemen, is going to give Les Brown speech. This is my speech. The motivator from Detroit, it's my speech. You can't take Mamie's boy. You can't take my speech. No, you got to go get your own speech. You can't come up here and take my speech. No. So I'm saying to you, can't nobody take your good? See, that which is meant for you has your name on it. No one can take your good from you. That's you. That work you've been given, that idea that you've been given, if you don't come out here with that idea, no one's going to bring your idea out here. Whatever you're sitting on, whatever idea you're working on, whatever passion, you've got to be like Johnny Youngblood. He said, hey, I've got to live what's in me. And let me tell you, I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. Why? i got peace of mind. You can't even put a price tag on that. I, I, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And I say to you, the universe is calling you. A young lady wrote me a letter once after hearing me speak in Detroit. And I had just finished working with some kids. And it, it really was a short letter. It was a short letter, but powerful. And the letter read, she said, the voice of greatness has called me. And I'm afraid to answer. Ooh. I felt that. I know what it is not to answer. See, I, sh I could have been doing this years ago, but I was afraid to answer. I had these bucks that I was hiding behind. 
Like Gideon, I didn't want to come. Not me, not me. I'm not good enough. I'm not. Wait, let me get ready. Let me get ready. You know, you ever seen those perpetual students? Oh, let me get ready. Let me get ready. Got a friend named Carolyn, been going to school 10 years, 10 years. Got all kind of degrees. Ain't doing nothing in life. You know? I'm saying answer your call. The universe is calling you. Hear something about life. You can't get out of it alive. Hello? You can't get out of life alive. Live now like Maria said. Live your dream now. So the other night I had a funeral and I don't mind doing it again. We buried but. We said, but you won't have no place in our lives no more. These dreams you've been killing. Oh, but you ain't going to kill no more dreams up here. Everybody repeat after me. But, but get, out of my life. get out of my life. I don't need you no more. I don't, need you no more. don't come back here. Don't Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, keep him away. Keep him away. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, I say, look at your life and decide that my life is beautiful that my life is meaningful to me. I'm not exactly sure what I want to do, but because my life means so much to me and there are no guarantees in life, I'm going to live as much as I can each day. I'm going to do what I can where I am right now. And whatever I shared with you, I wrote a, read, read a book called It Works If You Work It. That's what Johnny Coleman said. See, if you don't decide to act on your dream, if you don't decide to make a decision to live your life, if you don't decide to step into your fears, if you don't decide to say yes to your life, it will never work for you. The time for just wishing is past. Time for doing, that's the time right now. Time for acting on your dream, holding on courageously as Winston Churchill said and not lose enthusiasm. Time to face yourself. And talk to yourself in the mirror. Time to look around and become creative and see what need or service that you can provide with high standards so that people will talk about you being a master at what you do because of the commitment of pride and excellence and high standards that you've set for yourself. It's time for you to look within yourself and decide that I'm in charge of my destiny. I'm in charge here. And I'm not going to allow anybody to turn me around. I am determined that I'm going to make it. And here's something, ladies and gentlemen. When you make it important, it's not a preference. It's not negotiable. It's a must. And when you decide, I'm going to do it, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the difficulties, I'm going to make this happen because it's important to me, I'm saying, the universe will yield to you, and life will never be the same again. Live your dream. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum-pleasing pleasure, as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. Thank you very much.